Hello, welcome to the Iris podcast. I'm Lucy Smith and I'm here today with Jamie Weston, whose film Wings has been shortlisted for Best British and Iris Prize International this year. Thank you for joining me, Jamie. Um, so your film Wings is split into two parts, essentially. It's one is a sort of wartime love story between two women and the second is years later, years after losing touch, they meet again in a care home. First of all, I'm really curious about the stories that this may have been based upon. Like, how many women in World War II went through this experience? And have you heard much about the stories? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so, where it first came from was I was, it must have been 2014, and I was working on a heritage lottery funded documentary called Essex Girls with uh, Signals in based in Colchester. And as part of that, we looked through uh, women through the ages. So, like, for instance, the Dagenham Riots about how they sort of got equal pay for women and Bodicea, she, like, sacked Colchester and, like, sort of killed all the Romans with the, her Iceni. And um, part of that was also, oh, we did the witch trials as well. That was really interesting. Mm. And also the land girls. And when I was sort of um, sort of working on the edit for, for, the, for the doc, and looking at the land girls stuff, I realised that I didn't know too much about the land girls. You know, we'd all done history at school. We've all seen those war films. And yeah, I don't think I've ever really seen anything to do with land girls. And it just got me sort of thinking, um, all women at that time, um, all their husbands were away. Um, homosexuality hasn't just been invented. It was always yeah. it was always there. Um, and so it must have been a quite a liberating time for women to feel like they didn't have to um, hide against anything or they could just be themselves in some sort of way. And then this idea started whirling around my head and I just had this um, really cool image of two females seeing each other over like a pay bale or something and sort of falling in love. And that sort of image stuck in my mind for a good year before um, I was sort of walking home one day and my phone died. So suddenly I had my brain to myself for once and the whole ending just sort of clicked into place and I could see it all quite clearly, run home, opened up the, the computer, the sort of script, wrote it all down and then contacted Carla about it and then we started diving into more research. Um, some of my friends are all historians and they provided me with a load of actual uh, interviews with land girls that they'd captured in the 1980s. Oh, amazing. So I sat through them, did loads of research and we and yeah, we just sort of discovered that um, there wasn't really much um, in the media or press really about this about this time and these sort of stories yeah and did you come across stories like your characters in the film are they based off anything as, as you said yeah. you had the idea for them but they, they weren't particularly based off any particular individuals but they were certainly based off of people who'd had them similar experiences so what we did is we we did find um, sort of lots of instances where you would have people having sort of from a sort of secret relationships or um, that uh, I don't think in in the trenches, for instance, if you had two men who were in a relationship, that's obviously very much frowned upon. Whereas there was known to be female relationships in England, and people sort of sort of you know turned away and didn't really sort of comment on it so okay. because I, I don't think. I think people didn't like it as such, but I don't think people really, you know, there was more things to worry about at that time, obviously. Yeah, there's um, a sense that it's almost a comfort thing and women, like, society accepts them having quite close relationships, whereas not always with men. So, like, yeah, there's a vibe of it's comforting, she's helping her with her kid. Yeah, yeah. I could see why it would be a little less frowned upon than possibly men in the trenches who are meant, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we definitely we definitely found some stuff, and we we know this was going on, and it's just a, okay. a wonder why it hasn't really been commented on in in much, you know, in, in cinema really, because they're sort of interesting stories. Yeah, and your character Dora, once her husband does return, um, she she basically has to choose and decides to stay the quite you know the traditional family route, stay with the husband, keep the family. Um, was there any documentation ever of women who, once the war had ended and they were expected to go back to conventional life, that they went against this grain and chose the queer lifestyle? We hadn't found anything that specifically said that, okay. and if and if if people do find some, it'd be it'd be great to be great to see it. What we found is normally at that time, when the husbands sort of return from the war, because of society and the sort of stigma around it, even if 
even if they wanted to go to the queer lifestyle, you just really couldn't. You know, it was still at a time where you was married to someone and that was it. And the, the family unit was really important in, in England at that time. So um, even get the idea of getting divorced was quite a faux pas. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So and and then obviously with the, with the child. So I think for us, it was a real um, it was quite a difficult um, bit, bit to try and script and really get our head around because we didn't want it to seem that one that she didn't actually um, sort of a love Dora. Like we we didn't want it to seem that um, she she sort of um, was almost like cheating or it was sort of almost like a hidden because I think their their love was obviously genuine and real. Mm. Um, but when when they when the husband came back, I think she just had to. I think you know because I think she was still in love with her husband as well. Um, there's no real bad guys. It's just obviously life is quite grey, isn't it? Normally in situations like this, a lot in film it's always black and white. Mm. This happens and this happens. But I think we tried to look at our approach where it was like, well, really they wouldn't probably be able to have a proper relationship comfortably after that. Yeah. Um, just that wartime was this sort of crazy, almost out of lifetime for them, where they could have that. Where, where they could exists. have that, yeah. yeah. And, and I think if if even if there wasn't war, maybe they met, may, maybe they wouldn't have had such a close relationship, but I think they still would have had them feelings for each other. Okay, yeah. And yeah, so in in your film, you've got uh, when they meet in the care home later and they end up having a civil partnership, they don't have any opposition. They've got everyone wholeheartedly behind them, family who didn't presumably know about what happened during the war um, sort of seemed to accept them just quite easily. To what extent is this film almost a bit of a fairy tale, a bit of a daydream? Because LGBT ple- people, ple- whoop, LGBT plus people still have these struggles even today. Um, and I loved that your film had this happy ending. But yeah, I was wondering to what extent did you play with this idea of almost fairy tale aspects to it? Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean. With the ending, we sort of based it, it wasn't directly present. I think it was um, sort of close to when, you know, the Lord sort of passed, was that 2010 or somewhere? So we tried to right. base it a little bit like towards that area. I think the idea is that they're, you know, as they've got older, maybe their husbands, it's not 100% suggested, but their husband probably would have passed away. And then they've both been sort of left there in the care home. We're trying to suggest that the it's at a time where society has changed and people are more sort of on board for civil partnerships and stuff like that and more accepting so so uh, yeah i i definitely think that the family are well on board for it and i'm almost certain you know there would have come conversations and times much later in their lives where she probably would have come out okay so you're skipping ahead to when things have been worked out in yeah a way. there's like a the there's like a um like a tv thing there's like a tv broadcast of like the first people who got married the first mm-hmm. civil partnership and and that's where uh sort of order sees that on tv and then immediately sort of thinks ah you know i think you know i think it's about time times have changed enough and society's um sort of given us enough freedom and acceptance to finally make this a thing okay and, and yeah and also as you said like with the end there's so many films that end up for like in you know, a sad endings, and I was like, you know what? Yeah. It'd be just nice just to do a nice film with a nice ending, and actually, actually, it's quite refreshing to see a film with a nice ending because they're they're, they're they're so rare. Yeah, and especially with issues when like things are still being fought for, like rights and equality um, for LGBT plus people, it's yeah a happy ending. I agree. <laughs> it's just very refreshing, very nice to realise that you know there's you can celebrate these joys as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, throughout the 20th century, so things obviously improved and got to a point where rights were getting better and better and acceptance for LGBT plus people was getting better. As we get into the 21st century, do you, do you get the feeling that equality is just around the corner? Do you feel like there's a long way to go? What sort of sense do you get? Uh, so where I live in my sort of friendship group, I've often grown up knowing and being friends with uh, men and women who are married to men and women you know for me I just seem to be in a uh, maybe it's a bubble being in the arts probably is um, where it sort of seems that everyone's quite accepted um, which is quite an odd thing really Um, 
there's still a long way to go with everything and you still find there's a lot of opposition you know like everyone's like yeah I don't mind I don't mind as long as they're not doing it near me you right. know there's still that sort of there's still that sort of really odd sort of uh juxtaposition between people's ideas there but yeah I, f- I feel like it's there's a lot of hangovers from a previous generation and I feel like maybe in a couple more generations time we probably won't even be having to need these sort of conversations because I think it will just be integrated into our sort of society that this is just normal which it is amazing yeah I agree generations on generations yeah and whether the talking really helps with same that, with the yeah. film industry right it's like once once that elder generation of the, you know that Weinstein sort of age is finished and sort of people our age are then at their level the whole society in how films are being made and how films are seen in equality and diversity is going to be completely different mm. but we're still living in an age where the gate holders and the key holders and the people with the money are still at that level of uh, that sort of mindset so we're like probably what 40 40 40 50 years away from something interesting okay do you write do you see us at the hinge of it right now like is it just turning or did it turn a little while back is it about to turn i think it's it, the the stuff's in motion and it's like you know um and i i reckon by the time i'm old and retired um hopefully it, it, you know people shouldn't be having the same issues but there'll always be some issue that comes up it'll be it'll be something else because there always is but it, yeah, it can get better. Yeah, it definitely get better. Definitely, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the actors and the casting for this film. You'd already mentioned to me um, a bit about getting Miriam Margulies and things. Could you, yeah, talk us through the process of, you know, gathering everything up for this film? How did it become its whole? <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you're sort of creating a film, when like I've been quite lucky where I've made a few features and they've been distributed and I wasn't producing them I was only directing but because I was directing I sort of got to listen and learn a lot about um sort of how how the production works and how the producers get stuff on board and one of the things that's always really really important in order to get things distributed that gets things people being seen is is good casting so one of the things you've got to do is cast a lot of good talent now we're very very keen always myself and Carla on making sure that uh, the roles are diverse, but also you got new people in. Um, so we did have some sort of new people that's the first time acting in any roles. Um, but also, like you know, in order to get something going, you need you need some you need some talent there. Otherwise, people don't really sort of take any notice of your film, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so one of the things we sort of did is we got a casting agent on board, who sort of um, Amy Blair, who sort of put out on Twitter that was doing some stuff. And then Rosie Day was like, yeah, love, love the idea. Can we meet for a coffee? We had a coffee, had a lovely chat. Rosie's lovely. And she was really keen to get involved. So it was like, fantastic. That's amazing. We've got a fantastic actress. She's done loads of stuff. It's going to be really good. And she's really up for it. And most importantly, she's nice to get on with because, you know, you're making a film. You want someone you can actually get on with. You want uh, the team. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I have um, spoke to my other friend, Alex, who lives with Bobby Lockwood. And I was just like, yo, would you like to be in this? Uh, can I send you the scripts? And he, he like, loved the idea, thought it was fantastic. So it was like, fantastic, you know, we've got these two people on board. As we're coming out of the meeting around in Soho, um, we was just actually going to go to Chloe's, you know, one of the, the vegan cafe sort of thing. Okay. And um, we saw Miriam just like getting out of a cab and walking into a restaurant. And we had the script on us and I was like, oh my God, look. Look, Carl, it's your favourite actress <laughs> there. I, when I see famous people, I, um, I feel like I'm looking through a telly. Like, what's going on? Yeah. I was <laughs> was like, it just sort of see her? We sort of walked past her a bit. I went, oh, look, Carl, there's Miriam Mogley's there. <laughs> she goes, what? She goes, yeah, look, Miriam. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. She's like perfect for this. And was like, oh, she's gone in there. We should ask her. And I was like, no, we can't ask her. We can't. Don't, uh, it's ridiculous. We can't actually go up to someone and like intrude on them and eat, like having a coffee or something. Anyway, so after about half an hour of sort of plucking up her courage, I think she went in once and then sort of chickened out <laughs> and then come back out again. Then she eventually she went in and then spoke to her. I went over the road to sit and watch her have a coffee. Um, well, I was having a coffee, watch, waiting for her to leave. And she was in there for ages. And what she told me when she came out is she told her to sort of sit down and um, she read the script, looked it through and said, this is fantastic, love it. Who, who, who could I play? And we was like, oh... Um, we'd love you to play this role you know and she goes great excellent here's my here's my 
signature so you can know it's me take a picture this is my agent and i'll be back in the uk in six months see you then it was like uh okay amazing <laughs> so sounds we, meant yeah. to be if, if it went that smooth like, yeah, yeah it was yeah really and then we sort of think right then we better we better find some money i guess <laughs> <laughs> Oh, amazing. And yeah, was was finding the funding, how did you find that process? Um, funding was, we thought, when we got uh, the sort of the great, the perfect sort of cast list on board, we was like, in theory, the, the funding should be slightly easier, right? Because, I mean, you see people get short film funding all the time, and... Um, and they have nobody in it, you know, obviously the films are good, but they, you know, they have nobody's in it often, and they still get it funded. Um, and then, and then we sort of, I think Carla's, um, Carla does loads of conservation stuff and done like a, 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 a film to try and ban the rhino poaching and, um, ivory and stuff like that. Carla is co-writer and... Carla's co-writer, producer, producer, yeah, and also is the other leading actress in it. Amazing. And, uh, so she, um doing all this stuff a lot the born free foundation does a lot of the conservation stuff mm. uh which is sort of headed by virginia mckenna and the, the son will and so um i think carla met will and was just like oh i've got the script you'd like to have a read so you know get some feedback and he's like oh my mum would love this and um so then uh, sort of virginia came on board so that so then we thought right okay we've got the perfect lineup it's going to be hopefully easy to get some funding uh so the first thing i did is i contacted directors uk as I was a member, and also uh, contacted BFI, and both of them were just like, "No, we can't help you. Won't help at all." Okay. Yeah. So I was like, "Oh, right, um, right, okay." I don't know whether it was because they thought because we got these people on board, we, uh, I was suddenly loaded and had loads of like yeah. funding, was paying them loads of money or something. We actually they were just doing it all for free for the love of it, you know. So, so that was a bit of a shock. And then we decided to take it to Kickstarter and was really lucky where people were super supportive and we raised, I think, five and a half on Kickstarter. And then the rest of it, we sort of self-funded it, begged and borrowed and called in all the favours that I'd collected up over the years. And, uh, yeah, sort of did it like that, really. Right, it sounds quite stressful <laughs> in a way, like, as you're in it. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Most producing is like, yeah. is like one of them things where you hate it. But that's but it's it. Necessary. You hate it and it's necessary. But once right. you've done it, it's been really fun. Yeah, <laughs> and it does sound like you were able to draw on just connections, people. People seem the most important aspect yeah. of this. Well, I mean, whenever you're making films and you get a really good crew and you meet people, as long as you're a nice person and you work really hard, and, you know, films are always hard work, but as long as you sort of look after people, people tend to have a nice time retrospectively. You know, they remember it being a nice time. Obviously, on set, when you're doing stuff, it can be quite hard. You have to sometimes take a step back and go, we're just making art here. It's not like we're saving lives or at the NHS or anything. We're just right. we're just making a film. Um, but, you know, it can be a lot of hard work because everyone's really passionate about making something that's really good. Yeah. And then eventually you can like, call in loads of favours from people you've done stuff before because they sort of trust you that the, the, the project's going to be nice. And I think a collaboration, you know, well... Uh, a mixture of both it being a fantastic script which was really lucky and it was a great script but then it was good because it had a long time to be worked on it was almost like two years from the first conception so mm. so well, hopefully by that point it should have been pretty good um and then obviously a great cast and then because of that then you get it's quite easy then to get a crew on board because uh they know that they're going to be working with great talent and a great script and then you go, and I'm also going to fund you with all of the best kit you can get. So we had about half a million pounds worth of equipment that Excellent. we were shooting with, which is quite, you know, which really helps you get really good crew on board. Yeah. Especially when everyone's just doing it for, you know, jacket potatoes and yeah, uh, chili con carne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about the title of the film. So Wings, where did that come from? And why is it an important word for you to... Use. Um, so Wings was a couple of things. Um, first of all, as in it's like the idea of them, uh, fi the, the women finally spreading their wings and flying and getting the freedom. So it's almost like a metaphor for the freedom that they suddenly feel towards the end of the film. Okay. Uh, it's also like as a, you can also wrap yourself in wings as like they feel like they've sort of had to hide away from and shy away from everything. Um, and also the, the, the sort of the wings was also like the idea of of the. Um, the, I think it was more in America though, but uh, the women's um, army, and, and okay. like the and also did stuff with the RAF, 
with the yes. with the guys. So there was like a quite a few mixture of like war references and almost like metaphors for um, sort of freedom and and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that works really well. I really like you saying the sort of comforting thing, wrapping mm. wrapping around like, and you also when you said that first image of women's eyes meeting across hay bales, that sort of that I just saw saw immediately the scene in your film where that happens, and it's almost like the lighting you use the. It's just a warmth to it and a real, like, you filled with this feeling as, as they're falling in love. Mm. And yeah, and especially the 1940s sort of home with the pastel colours and the lighting. Were you aware of making this sort of almost a romantic sort of era? Like, from the start was this, this needs to look like this. And, you know, the set is so evocative in this film, I think. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, 100%. Like, we spent um, a long time working with... Um, the production designer Eileen and uh, Mary, our costume lady, and even Brower, who was doing all the set design for all the bit of the set. Oh yeah, in the bunker, um, and Bear, the DOP, and even we even had really early talks with Chris, who was doing who was the colorist, and then I'd like developed all big um, sort of uh, mood boards and scenes from films that I was really inspired by. Mm. Um, so yeah, there was a real big. Um, effort from all the team to come together to make sure as you know always you're making the same film and it's the same vision and everything sort of correlates and one of the important things that we did um, was I, I, I really like the idea of trying to make things look more vintage and old so one of the methods we used is um, obviously we're shooting on the Alexa so that really helps it get that nice sort of film look and then I think was using like um, Cook Master Primes so like you know so then you've got nice soft image and then we stuck like a uh, a quarter black frost filter over the lens so you've got that nice dispersion of uh lights that's quite common now in a lot of films this is so much more complicated <laughs> than i could ever imagine sounds, um sounds i mean like there's a lot of work to get yeah like, and i like yeah. watching i like watching um a lot of films before I any before I direct anything, I watch a lot of films to get some inspiration, and I'm always like, "Oh, I like that shot, I want to use that." Okay. And I found that at that time, um, there was a very big theme to using pro mist filters on cameras um, for anything that was vintage. And actually, my first feature, we used a pro mist filter on the lens because it was set in the 80s, and we wanted to give it almost like a classic look. So, um, so yeah, there was a lot of um, thought about how to stylize stylize the looks uh definitely yeah yeah it works it's just it's really beautiful to look at yeah i wanted to ask should more films be made about hidden lgbt plus pasts because women in world war ii was something i actually had never even considered and yeah is there anything you would like to make or like to be seen made about these hidden histories that people need to know more about oh yeah 100% yeah I mean historical drama um it's something I really love um and one of the key reasons for really being keen to make it really pushing it other than any other sort of project um <clears throat> was really like you said I don't think I've ever seen something like this before and if I'm racking my brains and thinking what's this similar to and I can't really think of anything then that means it's got something special right because you want to you always strive as you know in cinema to make something that hasn't been seen before or to shed a light on on sort of hidden past and it's even more important when it's stuff you know stuff that was really affecting people or like these sort of um uh stuff that people couldn't necessarily talk about or have or have something to relate to or have a film for their you know, sort of the problems that they'd faced in the past and problems that they still might be facing now. Yeah. Um, and in terms of new stuff, like, like I, th I absolutely love the film Hidden Figures as well, right? And that was almost like a film that, you know, in a similar light that hadn't really had much um, exposure. So there definitely needs to be more. Um, I don't know quite what. I don't know. I don't have anything off the top of my head. I guess that's the point. We need to dig, dig into these. <laughs> yeah. Things. Use the yeah, there, there's. Yeah. Um, uh, I I like doing history stuff, as I said. So I think definitely more collaboration with um, sort of archives and stuff like that to try and dig out more stories that haven't been heard before would be really great. Yeah, it's a good idea for projects. Yeah, you've done. You mentioned you've done some feature films in the past. I was wondering, in terms of short film in particular, what do you think are the key ingredients? to make a short film what's important as opposed to any other film like, 
Uh, for a short film, you want to, I guess, jump right into the action. So there's no sort of setting up the world. The world you set up the world, but you set it up very quickly. Yeah. So in Wings, I don't need to do a load of stuff introducing the Second World War because, and or introducing the time the time and stuff because you already sort of know it straight away because of the costume and the lighting and the house design and, and the sort of the music and everything that everything reminds you of that time period you may not be hugely familiar with history but you've got an idea of round about the time of the second world war people kind of look like this so you know straight away so one of the important things is just to jump straight in with the action um with short films as well is it doesn't have to always doesn't have to always resolve um like like a film might um sort of like be rounded up you can get in early and leave suit leave early yeah as well. exactly yeah. and um you know just try and think like what what is interesting don't go too many complicated routes so for wigs it was quite simplistic where it's kind of you know it could be you know boy meets girl boy leaves girl meets girl right girl leaves boy meets girl again boy leaves <laughs> and girl meets girl again you know yeah. it's, it's quite simplistic it's just a, it's just a a simple romance sort of story and with a lot of short films it's like you're you're following one thread with a feature film this is happening then this happens and this happens while this is also going on underneath you don't have time to do all that in a short film i mean yeah in a short film so um it has to be a lot simpler and um you've got more you can definitely be more experimental with short films as well with a feature they're normally commercialized this is normally a product that someone wants to buy uh, okay. or this is going to be distributed in the cinema or on TV, so you're like there for a story, for a sort of a formatted thing that you understand. For a short film, you're going to be there for, you know, 15 minutes maybe. And so you can kind of just do something a little bit crazy that nobody's seen before. Okay. And yet you were still talking about it needs to be, you need to think about who's in it and what's in it. Is it just that feature film, usually someone else is telling you, you need to be doing this and this, but you've just got that in your head for your short? Or... Yeah, exactly. I mean, when, I mean, the thing is, is um, it depends where you want to go with your stuff, right? So the little cheat is, and this feels a bit weird telling you guys, <laughs> because it's kind of works as well. The little cheat is, is that with film festivals, you want to get Joe Bloggs in the door, right? Because it's also, film festivals are also a business. Mm. Film festivals need to sell their film festivals. So they need, they want great films, but they also want great films that are going to get not just filmmakers in, but everyone in. Right. And so if they can have a talent that they can use as part of their marketing campaign, you've got more chance of getting selected for the festival because it's going to help the festival as well. Yeah. So yeah. if for me as a filmmaker wanting to push my career further, I have to think strategically about how I'm going to do that and not just... You know, I want to be an artist and I'll make my art, but I've also got to think of the, the end game. Yeah. Again, I don't think, I think it's all about relationships and building those connections. It's not always going to, it's not superficial entirely. It's yeah, like, yeah, of course. I'm helping you, you're helping me. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's get these stories, these hidden stories yeah. told. As I yeah. said, that's my marketing producer head mm, on board, sort yeah. of looking at that strategy from that point. Yeah. Yeah. What's next for you? Do you have any projects lined up? Are you filming anything coming up or? uh doing a few things um so I've, I've i've i shot another short film last summer before all the lockdown uh which was really cool it was like a uh, it's like a, just a dance movement film uh all shot in epping forest on oh, the alexa nice. mini with anamorphics everything's on steadicam um and it was about like the four elements and how and how sort of uh, humanity or the sort of the human image has sort of destroyed nature and then nature sort of fights back and like sets everything on fire and everything's burnt. Wow. And with dancers, it's... With it's dance, a, it's all wow. like a sort okay. of a, yeah, dance, experimental dance movement piece. Oh, it's okay. a bit odd. I don't, it feels like I'd it might be that. a, it feels like <laughs> it might thing. be a, you know, a Vimeo staff pick. So I don't know how well it would do in the festival circuit because mm. um, I don't really know what genre it would go under. Um, but that was a really exciting film. That's just finishing post-production. I've just finished writing a um, sort of a, an audio book, um, start of a series. That's a sort of a sort of a detective, a cult detective thing. Um, and there's also like a, maybe a, I want to make one more short film, I think. And then, and then I've done my sort of three little short films that I've gone back to doing them before I want to go back to making features again. But my okay. next short film, I'm sort of in the very early stages of 
thinking about it. It's like a medieval, a medieval Game of Thronesy style, something or other. You know. Okay, you seem to like have be able to have your fingers in lots of pies. Like any genre, you'll, you'll explore anything. Mm, yeah, I, I, like that. Well, I just you know love just love making films. So give yeah. me anything. Documentaries as well. I'm always doing docs. Nice. Um, I, th- I think I'm, I'm quite lucky in the sense that although I'm a freelancer and I do this sort of stuff, I also work for a production company, so I produce and direct with them. So I'm always doing something. Um, I've been doing loads of stop motion animation, actually, making them oh, over lockdown because I can do that by myself. Yeah. What do you use? Is it like clay stop motion? Uh, do, yeah, sometimes clay. Sometimes we do um, like sort of cut out stuff and then mix that with digital, mixed media, um, top town, you know, classic picture stop motion on a rostrum and using dragon and set nice. up in the studio and stuff like that so are these up anywhere that people could watch uh so the other company i work for is signals so if you just go on like signals.org.uk okay. we're sort of like an arts charity nice. and uh, yeah we've got loads of cool stuff and we work with young people and train them and teach them and all that sort of stuff as well so there's all sorts of things brilliant yeah and my final question so looking ahead and crossing our fingers a bit this film is up for best british but also up for the international iris prize short which is a 30 grand prize what would you do should you win um probably have a little party yeah yeah, yeah. i like it yeah. <laughs> you mean in terms of making a film yeah i mean well tell me more about the party <laughs> we'll talk about the film. Yeah. i'll probably have a big cheese party cheese and wine cheese party i like it okay. cheese and wine what's party, your favorite cheese uh roquefort or maybe manchego Ooh, okay. well, i like a blueberry as well nice or maybe I'll have a coffee party. I've got really I'm currently into proper coffee. Proper coffee and proper coffee. <laughs> yeah, nice. I've been watching a lot of James Hoffman on, on YouTube as like world barista champion. <laughs> so. Sweet. Coffee and cheese, I actually think goes pretty well together. So you could consider, you know, mixing that up. Yeah, yeah. I saw a great video yesterday about coffee and salt. Ooh, Adding okay. salt to your coffee. Yeah. Interesting. Right, tell me about your film. Then. Right, about the film <laughs> I do. Yeah. Like? <laughs> um, yeah, if I, if I think if I've got the 30k and I would, I would actually love to do um, like as like my the medieval idea and okay. I thought it'd be fantastic to do almost something like where you had the two leads being like, it's almost like pitched as your sort of classic medieval sort of fighting film. But the two leads are sort of actually like in a relationship and they're both might, might be both male or both be like female or something. Um you can imagine like the sort of crusades, but the two the two sort of men uh, who are sort of at the front of the on the horse Put are actually lovers, you know, which is something you wouldn't normally ever see, right? Or like medieval um, sort of gay romance right, stuff, okay. uh, which might be quite interesting. Um, yeah, something with heavy armor and claymores. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. <laughs> well, I look forward to that. I really hope that future comes true. Brilliant. Well, that's all for now. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much. This has been the Iris podcast for 2020. I'm Lucy Smith. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook.